Hello everyone and thank you for coming to a new lecture of our BBME 600 uh, seminar series. We are very happy to have today with us Dr. Caroline Wagner, uh, who is an assistant professor in the bioengineering department at McGill University. And she's focusing on understanding the interactions between pathogens and biological fluids and modeling the effects of these interactions or at a population uh, uh, level disease. Uh, this is level. So um, Caroline uh, holds a master and a PhD degree from MIT and she uh, has a, uh, got trained uh, as a postdoctoral, at a postdoctoral level from Princeton University where she studied uh, mathematical modeling of diseases. And today she will uh, introduce us to her latest work uh, on uh, different uh, issues on COVID-19 pandemic. Caroline, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I want to talk about new stuff, which I'm excited about. So this is what we've been working on for the last year in the context of COVID-19. So sorry, it's going to be a lot about COVID-19. Um, but at least I'm going to introduce at the end some work that we're starting to get off the ground from more the experimental side and with some actual people that I'm getting to train. So that's very exciting. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to have a chance to talk about that. Um, so it's, the talk's sort of going to follow a timeline of what the last year and a half has looked like because that sort of inspired the progression of the work. But uh, as a general statement, I'll introduce this by saying uh, we can think about a lot of factors interacting in the context of disease control. I'm naming it immunology, epidemiology, and evolution, which I'm going to talk about extensively in terms of the uh, modeling work that we've done. But then also I think there's a lot of room for biophysical processes that are largely omitted from disease models in general, and that's what I'm going to talk about at the end. Um, so the, early on we sought to develop sort of a very minimal conceptual modeling framework to think about how these concepts interact in the context of modeling uh, disease trajectories. And so these are the three main questions that we asked and sort of I'll work through them sequentially in terms of how we thought about them. So first we wanted to think about how the impact of the strength and duration of both natural and vaccinal immune responses um, might affect sort of the burden and timing of infection for COVID-19. Um, so that brought us to basically fall, so last year, this time, uh, when vaccines still seemed like a pipe dream and then miraculously they came out pretty soon thereafter and then uh, that sort of moved on to us con considering the question of how dose spacing might affect uh, trajectories based on some evolutionary considerations that I'll tell you about. And then lastly, so now we're talking 2021, 20, uh, the question of how vaccines were allocated between countries became very important. So these are sort of the three questions that motivated the work, and I'll talk to you about some of the modeling we did along the way. So uh, the basic framework we developed at first to think about this uh, idea of sort of imperfect immunity, it builds on what we're going to call an SIR in brackets S model. And I'm sorry to those who have taken class with me and heard this before. This part will be a little recap, but you haven't heard any of the later stuff, so that's good. Um, but essentially, if you've uh, heard about some aspects of disease modeling, which at this point everyone has and with the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the models are very simple. They rely on ODEs to think about moving individuals between uh, classes of susceptibility or infection to a certain condition. And the most basic of those models is called an SIR model, and that makes the assumption that after you acquire an infection, you're immune for life. Uh, and there's actually some pathogens that more or less obey that, but not very many of them do. So typically you have the chance of getting reinfected. Um, although you sort of the extreme model for reinfection would be called SIRS completely, in which case you are just as likely and your outcome for infection the sec time, second or third time around, it will be identical to the first time around. So that's a model that essentially assumes you're going to lose all immunity to an infection. So we asked ourselves the question last year when it was really unclear, you know, were people going to be reinfected with, with this, this disease? We asked ourselves what would be the impact of sort of where COVID, SARS-CoV-2 will fall on that spectrum in terms of what we might expect for the future. So we drew on this model we're calling SIR in brackets S. And the way it works is that you can, if you're a completely naive host, you start out in this SP category. You can get a first infection, so that's a primary infection. You'll, you can recover from that infection, in, in which case you're fully immune. 
But then there's a, we say there's a chance you're going to, well, you will wane out eventually, but the, your level of susceptibility to a subsequent infection might not look like what it was the first time around. Maybe you'll be a bit less susceptible. Maybe the type of infection you get will be a bit less severe. So it's accounting basically for some memory that's going to be residual and it's going to give you a little protection, but it might not be quite the extent of na immune naivete that you had before. And so what we basically did was ask ourselves, all right, depending on where we put SARS-CoV-2 on the spectrum, if we model it more like SIR, if we model it more like SIRS, what does that mean in terms of the projections when we run this model forward and we say, what are the peaks going to look like? So uh, this is sort of an example of the kind of output we are getting. And the, I'm going to show a lot of these plots, so I'm going to say what they are. We call them area plots, and they basically just show the composition of, of this uh, population over time, uh, where the colors correspond to these uh, susceptibility and immune profiles. So initially, before we, well, when we see the pandemic, everyone's susceptible, so everything is gray. And then you can see that the red and the pink categories correspond to primary and secondary infections, and then the, the purple categories correspond to different types of immunity. And so what the model showed was really just by playing around with the assumptions we, we made for how strong immunity was to a subsequent infection, we got really different projections for what uh, expected case timing and burden would be like. So the left is poor immunity. You can imagine that to be, we said you're quite susceptible second time around and your protection won't last very long compared to robust immunity where maybe you had a much longer period in the R category and you were much less susceptible moving forward. So, that was maybe not completely unexpected, but uh, nevertheless sort of something that needed to be pointed out at the time. And then we introduced vaccination again, thinking, you know, maybe optimistically we'd have vaccines sometime this year, uh, which and so then obviously it was a huge, wonderful surprise when they were available much sooner. Um, but in any case, to add vaccination to a model like this, you just add a compartment where you can move people from being susceptible to being vaccinated. So obviously the advantage of a vaccine is you don't have to become infected to reach the immune category. Category, you can skip that step, which can be associated with mortality and morbidity. Um, and so then we can make assumptions for how long vaccinal immunity lasts. We can wing you out of the vaccine category and assume you might become susceptible again. So we can play around with parameters there again. And again, uh, assuming, making assumptions for how good vaccinal immunity might be and natural immunity, the, the sort of takeaway message is that in always providing vaccination decreases infection burden. So it does, even a not great vaccine, we've said, would have a positive impact on uh, cases. Um, but uh, you can see, like, the scenarios really range. So a really good vaccine and really strong immunity looks like no peaks, essentially, after the first pandemic peak. But weaker immunity without a vaccine looks like sort of epidemics every year. So there's a huge variation in projections. And this, again, is not by changing the r naught of the pathogen. It's not by doing anything like that. It's just by saying how good is this immunity that you're going to get and how long will it last. So as I said, that brought us to uh, like fall 2020. And then if you remember at the beginning of 2021, when the vaccines were starting to be administered, uh, the, we sort of realized we're going to be dealing with mRNA vaccines predominantly that have a two dose course. And so some countries said, all right, well, we don't have a lot of these vaccines, so what we're going to do is give many people one dose. Quebec was followed that trajectory, and the UK did as well. Um, and the goal would be immunize many people, but at the time we didn't know a lot about how good the protection from one dose was relative to the, to the full two-dose two dose schedule. So the countries like the United States would be sort of the opposite, who said right off the bat everyone will be sticking to the sort of three-week or four-week manufacturer required spacing, uh, even though that meant sort of immunizing people more slowly because you have to get, follow, you, you can imagine if you only have four doses to give and you're giving everyone two versus giving everyone one, the rate at which you're going to immunize people is going to be more slow. So we said to ourselves, okay, let's sort of think about what happens and play this out again using this model. We had to update the model because now we don't have one vaccinated compartment. We have two vaccinated compartments, which represent the first dose and the second dose. And again, we can make assumptions that these vaccines might be imperfect and you might wane to be subsequently susceptible after having one or two doses. You could get reinfected. So you can see these models, even though they're sort of simple on paper, the number of compartments rapidly uh, blow up as you add intricacy to the types, to the sort of sequence of infection or vaccination. And so uh, this led to sort of a huge diversity of 
people within the population, you have completely susceptible people, you have people with waned uh, natural immunity or one dose or two dose vaccine immunity, and, and sort of I'll get to why it was so important to consider all these groups in, uh, distinctly, but then we took this model and said, now let's run this forward. Again, making assumptions, here the key question was, how good is a first dose relative to two doses? So obviously you can imagine if the, if the protection from the first dose was equivalent to protection from two doses, then it's sort of a no-brainer. You just give everyone one dose, you can immunize more people. Why would you waste the second dose? But that was a huge uncertainty at the time. So the question was, you know, what's sort of the, the medium-term implication of, of how you allocate doses? So here you can see these area plots, plots start to look more messy, but now these colors represent the cases that I showed before. Here what you're seeing on the left-hand side is this is, a bit of a, this is a bit of an extreme argument. We never said anyone would follow a one-dose strategy exclusively, but it's meant to simulate a strategy where you have a long spacing between doses. So here uh, the strategy is to, to focus on immunizing more people with a single dose. Here the strategy is to follow the manufacturer recommended three or four weeks spacing. Uh, here we're assuming a relatively modest rate of vaccination within the population and again we're comparing scenarios where on the top the first dose confers relative, relatively poor immunity relative to two doses and this, and this bottom is, rel is robust immunity. So across the board, uh, one thing that's interesting is even when the first dose is expected not to be very good, the first peak after the infection begins is lower when you follow a one-dose strategy. Why is that? Because you're just immunizing more people. So our assumption is these vaccines, even if they're not good, they're probably going to last at least on, immunity will last on the order of at least a few months or something like that. So on the time scale of which we're observing, it looks like it is beneficial epidemiologically in terms of how many people are getting infected to, to immunize with one dose and, and more people. Um, but sort of one of the interesting aspects of doing that is the orange category gets really big and I'll talk about why people were concerned about that in a second but the orange category is people whose one dose immunity has waned. So that was really the category that people were really uh, anxious about at the start of 2021 which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and then as you can see when uh, the immunity, the assumption of immunity is uh, is worse though in this one dose strategy in the longer term this you know things start to look worse so even though in the short term you might reduce this peak you can get more frequent peaks because of the fact that people will quickly lose this immunity and become susceptible again so we can you know play around we can say all right what if we don't just always follow a one dose strategy which we knew was a bit of a straw man argument anyways because no one was advocating doing that, but we said, what if after 12 weeks, when we assume that supplies are bigger, you allow countries to switch to a two-dose strategy? So that, we found, was a good way to sort of still achieve this rapid first peak mitigation, but not incur this sort of cost of more cases down the road and a large accumulation of this orange color. So now I'll tell you why the orange color was uh, thought to be problematic. So um, we... So at the time, I'm not sure how closely you were following the discussion about dose strategies, but people were raising the, the question of, well, what happens if we give a lot of people in society like a small amount of not very good immunity from a single dose? Uh, again, this was a big assumption because it wasn't obvious at the time that a single dose would give poor immunity. And in fact, it, it's not very bad at all. It's quite good, uh, even though eventually now we use two or even three doses. Uh, and so what people were drawing on was largely an argument that you could think about in terms of this phylo dynamic model. So a phylodynamic model combines evolution of a pathogen with transmission between people. And so what this kind of model says is if I'm a host and I've never seen a pathogen before, I have zero immunity to that pathogen, and then the pathogen infects me, it's going to be able to replicate very quickly because I don't have any real defenses to mitigate that replication. So when I'm on the left hand side here, I get a lot of abundance because the pathogen can replicate a lot. But at the same time, I'm not really putting any pressure on that pathogen because I don't have previously existing immunity to it. So as we know, these RNA viruses, when they reproduce, they might make a mistake here and there, and they do make mistakes here and there. But this theory says if, if I don't have any specific you know, defenses that are guiding that virus to evolve one way or the other, there's no real reason for, it to, for me to put selection pressure on it. And then the other end of the spectrum says, if I have full protection towards a pathogen, then the virus shouldn't be able to reproduce at all. So it gets in me, my antibodies find it, target it, it's gone. Then there shouldn't really be any possibility for replication, which means no pos possibility for making a typo in the first place. 
And so then what it says is maybe there's a sweet spot in between where I have just enough protection that you know, the virus can get in, it can reproduce, not as much as it would have if I'd been completely naive. But now the protection that I have might guide uh, the virus to evolve in one way or another that might be advantageous and let it get around my immune responses. So this was sort of, now maybe you can see where this uh, discussion was coming from in terms of peop saying, people saying, well, what if we put a lot of people over here from like giving them a little bit of, of knowledge about the, the pathogen? Could that be problematic in terms of what we see in terms of evolution? And so this, you know, it's a very complicated argument because you could also argue, well, you know, in prior natural infection with the pathogen might do something similar. And to think that, you know, this is all a phenomena that's happening within a single host is a huge simplification of this picture. So we know, for instance, that the reason we get an annual flu shot is because flu is evolving all the time. And that's not necessarily because a single person you know, got a mutation that then spread like wildfire within the, the population, it's believed that it's really a sort of a population level phenomena for how this evolution happens. So this was a very big simplification to make, but we said, all right, what if we take a model like this and we couple it to our evolutionary model and we just make assumptions about where people with secondary infections fall on the spectrum. So we can assume if you've had the infection before, now you're reinfected, we can assume you sort of how much pressure you might put on evolution. And we can do the same for people who've had a single dose and then that immunity is waned, or two doses and that immunity is waned. So this is the sort of the orange category was the people who've had a single dose and that immunity was had waned. When there was a large number of those people who could subsequently be infected, this sort of pressure term that we came up with could potentially get large. So we consider different scenarios basically of just where we put these people on this curve. Uh, then how we calculate a pressure is just saying how many people who are infected in this category are there at any given time times this weight that we've assigned them based on where they fall on this curve. So without, you know, so it's not a huge surprise that the assumptions that we make hugely contribute to sort of the outcomes that we see. And we can do this following different uh, dose strategies and different assumptions regarding the strength of immunity. Um, but it does go to show that, you know, if these, this pressure is going to arise in this way in terms of evolution, then the strategy could play out in terms of, you know, following up with that second dose could cut back on some of the evolutionary pressure that we might face just by mitigating this possibility of sort of partial protection. Okay. So that's the second story. How am I doing on time here? Doing very well. Okay. So then uh, 2021 started playing out. And, uh, you know, even in Quebec, people were immunized with their first dose, but then everyone was followed up and was given a second dose. And by the summer, everyone who wanted one had essentially received two doses. Uh, and then the question came up, well, we're doing a very good job vaccinating um, high income countries and we've done a horrible job vaccinating low income countries. So to this day, there are many high income countries where more booster doses have been administered to the population. So more people have a third dose than people in low, low income countries have a single dose. So there's been a huge sort of discrepancy in terms of how vaccines were allocated. Um, you could argue on ethical grounds why you, that may or may not be a good idea, but we wanted to think about it more in terms of epidemiological and evolutionary grounds. So we said, okay, let's take this model that I've just shown you, and now let's think about two worlds. So now each world is the whole set of system of equations that I showed before. So each world is governed by that flow chart I showed before, but we assume that one region has access to vaccines, we call it the high access region. And we assume that this region gets to decide how much of its vaccines it wants to share with the other region. So it can choose to share all its vaccines, it can choose to share no its vaccines, none of its vaccines, and we sort of play out the dynamics of both populations together and move it forward in time. And we consider two ways through which they cannot interact. In the first um, scenario, which we call the decoupled framework, we assume that they're basically completely in isolation. So one world is living in its own bubble, the other one's living in its own bubble. The number of infections in each world don't matter. There's no way that they can move between the worlds. All that matters is how many vaccines I give to each region. And then the other scenario, which we call the coupled framework, says, well, actually now, you know, the cases in one region might affect the other. And we do that, first of all, by allowing people to just move between the countries. So that could reflect like travel or something like that. And then the other way that we do it is to use this evolutionary model that I talked about and say, okay, every time that pressure term gets above a certain pressure, like it gets above a certain threshold, 
let's pretend that that is sort of some quasi-evolutionary event. We're not going to call it the emergence of a variant because our model is too simple to predict that, but it might generate sort of an increase in transmission across the board because of some sort of evolutionary event. So that's the way that these two worlds are coupled, and then obviously by the sharing of vaccines in the coupled framework. So we said, okay, let's take this and play it out and see uh, what happens. So first, starting with the decoupled world, which is quite a simpler model, um, we can look at the, what happens at equilibrium in the long term. So we can take the model, we can run it out to when there's no more change, we could consider an equilibrium situation, and we can say, what's the total number of infections across both countries at equilibrium? So here, this is what this uh, figure is showing. The x-axis is the fraction of vaccines allocated to the low-axis region. So if you're at this point, then the high-axis region gave all of its vaccines to the low-axis region. And then the colors are the global vaccination rate. So a purple scenario would be much better for the world. It would mean we have a huge availability of vaccines and we can just vaccinate people more quickly. And then the columns represent um, these assumptions that I've been talking about, how, about how good is the immunity that vaccines are, are providing in the first place. So ranging from quite bad assumptions on immunity to quite good assumptions on immunity. And then <laughs> there's a lot of um, subtleties you can see here. And then the uh, rows represent assumptions that we make about how much transmission is there in each country. So that turned out to be a big question and it provided a lot of complexity because if you have two countries where one has very high transmission rates compared to the other, then you can imagine what the model says in terms of how to minimize infections might not be 50-50 distribution of vaccines. It might be giving more to the region with a lot of circulation and transmission. So the top row assumes perfect symmetry and transmission, but then the bottom two rows assume asymmetry. So across the board though, what the, the, this very simple model says, and this had been shown before uh, for SIR models, but never for um, models with waning immunity as far as we're aware, um, sharing is basically always as good or better than a scenario of not sharing. And in particular, when the availability of vaccines is high, when the vaccination rate is high, and when the protection from vaccines is very good, sharing is really, really good. So you're sort of, by not being at zero or one, you have a huge decrease in infections relative to when you retain or give all vaccines. So we can sort of see why that's the case by not just showing the equilibrium number across um, combined between both countries, but here we're actually just looking at for each country. So the dashed line is the LAR and the solid line is the HAR. And again, the x-axis is the same. So when the, here we're dealing with a situation of asymmetrical transmission and a very low vaccination rate. So here you can see the problem is when you have such a low vaccination rate, there's a trade-off where the more vaccines that the HAR gives to the LAR, that just means more infections in the HAR and less infections in the LAR. So it's not necessarily a problem. You could argue that if the total is still lower, there might be advantages to doing that, but it's still, you know, it's still sort of a zero-sum game in terms of like, if I give them away, uh, my cases go up, your cases go down. But when you can get these rates high enough and when you can be in situations of sufficiently good immunity, you can see what you do is, what you do is there's no trade-off anymore. So there's a large range of allocation for the high access region where it can give vaccines away with no increase in its own infection levels while you see huge decreases in the low access region. And that's because in the model, it says, okay, the high access region has achieved herd immunity already at that level. So keeping vaccines beyond that is not advantageous anymore. Okay, so that's sort of the simple model at equilibrium. We can stop looking at equilibrium and we can look at the dynamics instead. So this is a five year period. We can plot what happens with sharing versus no sharing for different dose strategies. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but uh, uh, by and large we saw, okay, like obviously you can imagine if you have less vaccines in the HAR, there will be some increase in cases, but generally speaking, the decrease associated with cases in the low access region uh, such that the net uh, total amount was sufficiently lower made it such that sharing seemed like a pretty good policy. But it was not always 50-50 because again it depends on relative transmission rates, relative population sizes, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of subtleties. Okay, so now it gets even messier and 
sorry about that. But now we're dealing with the coupled framework. So now we allow for this phenomena of immigration. We allow for um, this possibility for these quasi-evolutionary events. And then we can, so then we can do like even more analysis, but the problem is the parameter space blows up very quickly. So this is our best attempt at keeping it minimal, but you can see it's very far from minimal. But this is sort of one of the simplest population uh, scenarios we can consider. We have both countries with the same population. And then what we can do is vary this rate, how quickly do infected people flow between countries, and then vary this asymmetry in transmission. So when you're above one down here, it means the low axis region has more transmission. When you're uh, below one, it means the high axis region has uh, more transmission. And then we can, again, sort of look at what happens as a function of the fraction of vaccines retained by the high axis region. And so, you know, if you just look at total and uh, total cases um, on, in a lot of scenarios, being away from the edges is very advantageous in terms of minimizing that. And that holds true also with a lot of subtlety for PTIs, which are these sort of quasi evolutionary events. And so you can sort of see how this. Oh, and then one last thing I'll say is that uh, not just cases might be important, but what we call severe cases might be important. Because we had to make an assumption about, you know, in a totally naive host, we might be able to estimate what fraction of COVID cases are gonna lead to hospitalization. And sort of th th those are numbers we can get from public health data, from epi data. But um, what seems to be playing out as vaccines become increasingly available is that even if you've been vaccinated and you have the chance of being reinfected, that secondary infection might look very different from a primary infection. And if we can get it to the point where those infections are not leading to hospitalizations and they're not becoming problematic for the healthcare system, then that's not a bad outcome, especially in low-income countries that might have more fragile healthcare systems to begin with. So keeping these severe cases low might actually be a bigger indicator for sort of the effect on healthcare systems than just the number of cases in an absolute sense. So how this plays out dynamically, um, I can pick a point here. So let's say I'm in a situation where the high, the low income country, or the, sorry, the low access region has a slightly higher reproduction number than the high access region. And let's say um, the high access region is keeping all the vaccines here. So they've chosen not to share. So then I can say, well, let's just plot what cases look like over time, assuming both frameworks, the coupled framework and the decoupled framework. So if we're in the decoupled framework, pointer, okay, over here, then for the high axis region, this looks like a very good strategy. They have very small number of cases. They're the blue, uh, the blue color, and they have none of these sort of potential evolutionary events. So they keep their evolutionary pressure very low, and that's because they've kept their infection levels very low and they keep their total number of cases very low as well. But then as soon as we allow for coupling, it's a totally different picture. And coupling is probably the more realistic scenario for the world. So now when we allow for coupling, the cases become much more similar between the two regions because you have transmission going back and forth. And then beyond that, what you have are these sort of are some, are quasi evolutionary events that lead to global increases in the transmission rate. So when you are in the coupled framework, uh, retaining all the vaccines starts to look like a bad strategy. Why is that? Because you're allowing for a lot of circulation in another region, which is going to turn around and become problematic for you down the road. And so I'm not going to show the, the data here, but then if we sort of change the strategy to sort of 50-50 sharing, we start to see that, oh, uh, that's actually starting to look like a better outcome if we assume that we're in the coupled framework, which we probably are in terms of how the world interacts these days for pathogens. Okay. That's what I wanted to take share about the modeling, and I hope I have some time to talk about, yes, I do, the experiments that we're working on. So takeaways from the model were that the burden and timing, first of all, of COVID-19 infections and the potential for viral adaptation we saw could be strongly shaped by immune responses, both after infection and vaccine. Um, it looks like the sharing supplies is advantageous in terms of epidemiology and evolution. So sort of the big argument here is you can't have a, a new strain evolve if you never had an infection to begin with. So the only way a, a variant em emerges is by having a person who's infected and then having the potential for the mutation to pop up. So essentially, if you can keep infections low everywhere, that seems like a good strategy for minimizing that potential. And so, so this argues that, you know, again, not you could base it on, maybe you, you want to use moral reasons, but even in the absence of that, um, just in terms of sort of the longer term outcomes for epidemiology and evolution, it looks like rapidly uh, immunizing the whole world is going to be very important. 
but then obviously there's asymmetries that it cause a huge amount of complexity and, and like I said it already looked like a mess and that was sort of our best attempt at keeping the parameter space small, space small. Um, but as soon as you assume the populations have different sizes or that the R naughts are not the same and transmission is different, um, you, you, there's a lot of, a lot of assumptions and, and subtleties that might pop up. Um, and then this is sort of the point I was saying before. Um, in absolute infections might also not be the right output. So if we're looking at sort of what is the benefit of these strategies, it might just be that counting cases is not the best outcome because if cases become very mild, if cases become sort of what common cold cases look like, then that might not be the, uh, the parameter we're really concerned about in terms of overwhelming healthcare systems internationally. So the fact that vaccines do appear to be protective against se severe disease, even if they're increasingly becoming uh, not protective against any reinfection, especially with Delta, um, that can still be extremely important. Okay, so that was a lot about sort of the models and I talked to you a bit about the ODE framework, but I didn't tell you much about like what parameters do we use in these models and, and how do we develop them and run them forward. So I thought I could talk about that a little. Um, so actually early on we had no idea how to parameterize the models and that's why we sort of built this framework that let us interpolate between SIR and SIRS because we said we don't know what a lot of these values look like and what's going to be the outcome of, of what these numbers are in the end. So early on we actually looked to data from rela related viruses and obviously there was data coming out early on from preliminary hospital studies and clinical information uh, to think about the natural history of the disease. So but if you've looked at any of the papers from which I'm, that's fine if you haven't, from early 2020, even estimates for a parameter as simple as R0 for this virus were, were you know, the, the spread in terms of the numbers people reporting was huge. And there's a lot of reasons for why that's the case. Uh, for one thing, people implemented um, non-pharmaceutical interventions very quickly. And as soon as you do that, your estimate for how easily a pathogen spreads becomes thrown off, right? Because now we're not really getting an, a measure of how rapidly does it spread in a fully susceptible population if everyone puts a mask on and stops going to work, right? Not to say we shouldn't have done that, we definitely should have done that, but it made it very difficult to, to really obtain like a, a quantitative and robust estimate for R0. So early R0 estimates range from like 1.8 to like 8, there, which is a big problem when you have an exponential to go from a factor of 1.8 to 8. So there's a huge variation. So anyways, what we did was we said, at least for the question of like how long will this immunity last, maybe we can look to related viruses. So we looked to other beta coronaviruses. So these are within the coronaviridae family that SARS-CoV-2 is in um, and within the specific genus of the beta genus. And it's really interesting because within that, um, within this group, there's common cold viruses, which humans are infected with all the time. They're just endemic in the population. We've all been infected with them many times, and we usually just have the sniffles, and that's it. But there's also pathogens like SARS and MERS, which are very, very bad. So what we saw was, we're looking at the human coronaviruses to start with, um, a lot of evidence suggested that at least if you measure things like antibody levels, which a lot of people take to be a measure of immunity over time, there was definitely evidence of weaning of antibody levels over a few months to say a year or two. And that's not inconsistent with sort of our own experience of how often we can be reinfected with these pathogens. But then, as I said, these aren't the only uh, viruses that circulate within this genus. There's also SARS-CoV-1, so the original SARS. So I was pretty young during that outbreak, so you guys were very young during it, but it was, it was bad. So, this, so SARS and MERS had fatality rates sort of on the order of in the double digits percentage. So that's terrifying. And so, um, you know, we can think about why we got SARS-CoV-2 and probably the reason for why it became a global pandemic was because this pathogen, for whatever reason, was just very good at transmitting between hosts. But luckily for us, it doesn't have a fatality rate in the 10s to 15s to 20% of people. So you can imagine what keeps people up at night with a lot of anxiety is the possibility of a very good pathogen that's very good at spreading between people but also has a really, really high associated uh, fatality rate. But again, even for this pathogen, which causes hugely different pathology in humans, right? Like this one's extremely fatal. Again, we saw sort of at least similar evidence of weaning of antibodies over the course of a couple of years, but it's interesting if you look at memory cells, so T cells uh, in particular here, there was evidence that they last a lot longer. And this is actually still a pretty big question in terms 
of answering how long is our protection from these vaccines and natural infection going to last. It's not obvious to take a picture from someone's blood of like how many antibodies are there over time and translate that into what's your actual level of protection. So that's what they call like a correlate of immunity or correlate of protection. And making that connection is actually very difficult. But at least this gave us a starting point. And we could say, OK, uh, can we sort of mess around with parameters in this range to start to parameterize our model? And then the other uh, big question that we had to think about was, what was going to be the impact of seasonality on our assumptions about transmission rate for this pathogen? So it's, we know very well that a lot of pathogens, especially respiratory viruses like SARS-CoV-2, exhibit very distinct seasonality. So we're all in the northern hemisphere. Right now, we know that typically when it's cold and dry, we're going to get the flu, we're going to get colds. We know there's this seasonal signature. But it's actually not very well established why that is. It's not clear whether it's actually some you know, physical process from it being dry and cold that's causing the pathogen to become less viable or to spread more rapidly, or if it's because we all just don't want to be outside when it's cold, so we're all indoors, and, and so maybe it's just a phenomena of our own behavior. And so if you remember, it was like April last year, and um, Donald Trump said, don't worry, uh, it's going to be gone by the summer. And so he's not, he wasn't totally unfounded in making that statement, because there is a lot of evidence for other pathogens that they follow seasonal cycles. But that's not at all what happened with SARS-CoV-2. And so we had to think about, you know, how do we model seasonality for this virus? We drew on some work that our colleague Rachel had done, uh, where she sort of said, where do these other viruses, so these are the other human coronaviruses fall. So here, uh, a straight line would mean that their R0 is completely independent of some climate measure. Here she's taking specific humidity. Uh, and, and the other extreme would be a pathogen like this. One of the HCoVs is called HKE1, which shows a really strong signal uh, between transmission rate and seasonality. So we said, OK, we can sort of assume where it's going to fall on the spectrum based on data from flu, other coronaviruses, and input that into the model. But I think what we saw and what our model shows and what Rachel shows is doing this was kind of like, I imagine, like if you have an elephant on a swing and you want to change the period which with the elephant is swinging, you're going to have a very hard time doing that because that elephant weighs a lot and it's got its own inertia and momentum. So essentially what the elephant represents is the fact that everyone in the population was completely susceptible to this virus. So the dynamics of the virus are going to be driven by the fact that everyone is immune and uh, sorry, everyone is naive. And that is really going to cancel out any small sort of contribution from a climate signal, which is sort of what you trying to push the elephant on the swing are going to be trying to do. But that's not to say that this virus might never show seasonality. It probably will actually. But what we think is that it's going to take until it becomes sort of endemic, an endemic pathogen that circulates more sort of like flu or cold for us to see a strong signature. So there's going to have to be enough population immunity that builds up before we're going to be able to reliably know how this virus responds to climate. OK, so this is why it actually can be useful to, to just say to reviewers, we built a nice application where you can just change all these parameters however you want, and then you can check yourself. Uh, what the impact of them does. So sometimes when you build a model like this, you know, there's different approaches. You have to validate why you chose the parameters that you did. You could do sensitivity analyses where you just throw in a bunch of random replacements for the parameter and look how big an impact that has on your projections. Or what we did is we said, here are these cool shiny apps where anyone can go and they can change any parameter that they want in the model and they can look at what the projection was. So I think in some cases, especially when you're dealing with models with a lot of uncertainty, there can be some value in, in doing things like that. But now, so into 2021, there is data that's increasingly becoming available. So uh, for instance, data is coming out. I'm not going to work. This isn't my data, so I'm not going to talk about it in detail. But how long does immunity last from natural infection or the vaccine? Uh, how good is protection in face of other variants? So this is all data that we're starting to get as people have been infected you know, for, and recovered for longer periods of time. Now we're starting to get the cohorts of six months, 12 months that we need to see how quickly is, are the antibody levels waning, um, and similarly with vaccination. Um, and so one thing now that we're interested in thinking about is, is, is thinking more carefully about the seasonality question. So people have done some very cool work to say, OK, what happens to, like, why might these respiratory viruses show a seasonal signal? And so there's this, uh, some theory that says, OK, I'm going to cough and I'm going to emit 
um, this particle, this, this droplet, that's, that's got a bunch of virus in it. It's also got a bunch of protein in it. It's got a bunch of ions. It's got all sorts of things in it. And it's going to evaporate under the action of it, the, this new external environment that it's in. So people have done studies where they just put droplets of, um, often they don't, they're not very biologically relevant, but just some buffer that has virus on a slide. They'll let it evaporate under different uh, climate conditions, and then they'll try to infect cells with that virus, and they'll say, when is that virus no longer viable? And so they try to sort of pull out this parameter space for how certain um, parameters, whether it's humidity, whether it's temperature, starts to impact the viability of the virus. So this is how people are starting to say, okay, for the moment, you know, all these models for seasonality have been sort of black box. They've just been taking epi data, crossing it with climate data and getting out some, some correlation. But now can we start to say, is there a real underlying physical model that we can use which might help us make better predictions about seasonality moving forward? So we're trying to, to think about that as well. This is my picture of that phenomena. So this is this person coughing and I'm very interested in mucus, which is the uh, protein, uh, sorry, mucin, which is the main protein in mucus, glycoprotein. So we're trying to think about, okay, what happens to these droplets that contain a whole bunch of complex biomolecules in them? What happens to the virus as its, as its environment is changing? So the droplets evaporating, the pH is changing, the ion concentrations are changing. What's happening to, to the viability of that pathogen? And can we think about it more directly? So now I have a student who's designing some of these experiments. Um, so she's built this very cool uh, chamber that she can control the temperature and the humidity in. And then she basically just sprays uh, droplets in it. Eventually they'll have mucin or they'll have uh, other components of interest. Um, probably not virus because I don't think we'd get approval to just spray a bunch of virus in, into a chamber. So we're going to have to think through that a little bit more carefully. But for now we're just using um, uh, fluorescent particles instead of uh, as a sort of proxy for that in a similar size range. And then we're going to look at the patterns of evaporation for how these droplets evaporate and start to think about what are, is the composition of the droplets doing in terms of how it, that affects these patterns. And maybe that can help us start to think about viability moving forward. And so this is actually a very cool phenomena from fluid mechanics um, called the coffee stain uh, coffee ring. So here this is just water and you can see most of the particles aggregate right at the edge and this is a phenomena driven by the surface tension of water. Um, but and, it, and I don't have nice pictures to show you today but when you put polymers like mucin in here what happens is it totally changes this drying pattern. So instead of all the particles being siphoned to the edge there's a much more uniform pattern within the droplet and we think that could be important because if this droplet is evaporating in the air and all the particles are pushed towards the edge they could face a lot more shear forces and stresses from the evaporating droplet than if they're sort of nicely contained within the center. So that's sort of the way we're starting to think about this now. Okay, I want to leave time for questions, so should I stop? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so. Unless, unless you have. No, that's okay. I was going to talk about a little bit more of the modeling, but I think I'll stop there and I'll, I'll take any questions you guys have. Similar to how you looked at like the seasonality of the virus, I was wondering if you looked at like population factors such as like increased susceptibility with like aging or like outbreaks and surges. That's a great point. And our models have been super simple because they've had no age structure. So that's been bad news for us in terms of dealing with reviewers because this is a virus that has huge age signature, right? So actually I didn't talk about this at the end, but right now we're working, we're trying to be able to generate more Canada specific projections. Um, because the models that I showed were like very qualitative, sort of not specific to any region. Um, so to do that, the models that we're building now are have full age structure. They have you know explicit consideration of hospitalization and stuff like that. Specific uh, ways for strains to interact and you know vaccines to give differential effectivity to effects effectiveness protection against different strains and you can imagine even that varies by age so the vaccine protection for instance is better in some age groups than in others so we're starting to work on that uh, we got to a model with 270,000 compartments so now we're, <laughs> we're trying to pair back because that was not good for the computer but yeah so that's the sort of when you I would say when you want to get like quantitative and match your projections to a specific region this it does seem like you need to include complexity to that level and then age you know you have these interesting interactions where age groups interact with each other differently, right? So typically, 
very small people interact with like medium people, their parents, and then very old people. So that we see these strong patterns of contact, inter like how groups interact. And so this comes back to study uh, fields like demography. So there's a lot of interplay with some social science fields as well. Um, and that we can sort of start to input in terms of how we allow these groups to mix in our models. Yeah, it's a great question though. Okay. Thank you for such a great answer. Yeah, okay. Next question. Hi there. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I wonder if you've tried to fit your models to any data. Probably. Yeah, that's what we're doing now. Okay. Yeah. So I, the reason we haven't done it to date is because, like I said, we weren't being specific enough on the assumptions that we were making. Now that we're making, so for the Canada-specific model, we're we're allowing for different strains, which is strains, which is probably going to have an impact, and age, ages, which is going to have an impact. And now the big question we have is like fitting that to hospitalization data. It's hard to fit to case data because, especially early on, the estimated case numbers are just way off because we weren't testing a lot. We were missing a lot of the infections. So that's actually one of the biggest challenges I find with this sort of data compared to science and engineering data, where I'm used to like going in the lab and very carefully. Um, getting some data that I'm going to fit to. Now you're relying on sort of data that's collected at the population level, and it's, that's extremely challenging to interpret. So, like in the first wave, we were testing what like 5,000 a day. That was it was nothing. Then the number of cases we're going to get is going to be hugely underreported. So you can imagine that what, that might tell our model, oh, the transmission rate is really low, but it might not be. It just might be that we're fitting to the wrong number. Um, but fitting these models is a whole other beast, and uh, people who do FB tend to be really good st at statistics because you have to have a way to like sample these giant parameter spaces and get confidence about uh, the parameters and your model at the same time. Um, but yeah, we're working on that now. Thank you. Yeah. Next question. Uh, so you, men you mentioned that um, the uh, value that you choose for the parameters can like vary really drastically and it's hard to know which one to pick so now you have this like interactive app yep. but before you developed that how did you choose um, where in that range you were going to be and also like is it possible to have an error estimate on how accurate some of your models are and and also like how common is that in modeling in general yeah so I've actually found that surprising because in science and engineering it's not uncommon for people to just publish something and say, this is my parameter, this is what the model says, see you later. And so f working in other fields, uh, people are much more, uh, insist on much more rigorous statistical analysis. So what we did here, like the reason I was showing the data from other coronaviruses, for instance, is because we said, OK, what do we put for how fast immunity wanes? And that let us say, OK, let's choose you know, six months for a bad outcome, a year and a half for a good income that outcome. That's sort of how we like guided ourselves on where to choose these parameters. And then what did we do? Well, when you publish the paper, you say, these are the numbers that I used, right? And then anyone can go and reproduce that. And then for our, we did some sensitivity analyses where we played around with the parameters. And then otherwise, we said, like, here, anyone can change the parameters, and you can see what the outcome is. So there's different approaches to deal with that. Um, when you're fitting to data, like I'm saying, it's going to be important to be much more like rigorous in terms of you know what's the uncertainty associated with each of the parameters we're using. But it's interesting because there's no right, there's no one answer, and there's no one convention across fields either. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know if you have or you will consider uh, the people who have already uh, infect been infected uh, when considering the doses. So they yeah. say s uh, some people, because they already are infected, maybe they it's like they have, a w they have taken one dose. So yeah. I wanted to, uh, I, I think it's probably really difficult to consider that but I wanted to know if you have a yeah so let's so follow me here that. let's say this person is susceptible they come infected they move into I they become immune they move into R right let's say there's another another option where this person goes right into being vaccinated now they're in V oh sorry 
Okay, so I'm, I'm, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that's a great point, and we're trying to do that. One of the tricky things about compartmental models, uh, sorry, you can't see this, I'm trying to show you that in a compartmental model, you can end up in one compartment, and then you're going to move out of that compartment, but I don't know how you got there anymore. So it doesn't, it's not a good way to, to retain a history of an infection. So anyone who ends up in recovered and then moves out, I don't know if they got there by being vaccinated or being infected, and the model can't keep track of that. So we're trying, like, by building this 200,000 compartment model to, to be as good as we can as doing that as possible. And we do, we are going to incorporate different susceptibility levels that say, like, let's say you had two doses of a vaccine or you've had a prior infection with alpha, what's your susceptibility to delta? We're trying to do that because you're right, it, it does look like it's very important. But if you really want to do that, you have to move to a model that's called something like an agent-based model where there you're saying you think, think about like a network connected a, a bunch of nodes that are connected and, and you can govern the rules of interaction for every point in that network and say okay this person was infected then they were vaccinated then they were this and you can explicitly track history a lot more than you can in a compartmental model so we're trying to do it but we're not going to be able to do it super super well uh, it does worth it to like uh, take it into account or yes yeah, yeah. So I, I think that, you know, especially as new variants emerge, that people will be differentially susceptible to depending on whether they've been vaccinated, whether they've seen the pathogen before. Um, I'd say at least being able to account for immunity from vaccination explicitly and immunity to, up to new variants explicitly is going to be very important moving forward. Hi, I just had a question about like how you decide like which parameters to include in the model. Like it seems like there's a trade-off between like a really complex and predictive yeah. model and one that's more simple. Yeah. So how do you make the decision of like which parameters to include? So if you want the correct answer, you you use like math theory that tells you what to do. So there's things like an information criterion where you can actually look at the trade-off and improvements that your model is giving you with complexity of the model. And the convention is always like never include more parameters than you actually gain from like a substantial improvement in your accuracy that your model can tell you. So there is, if you're interested, like real statistical tools and analysis that tell you how to do that. We were trying really hard to go for parsimony. So in the first model, like this SIR in brackets S is really about as simple as we can get to think about subsequent infections. But obviously Obviously, it misses a lot of the complexity, like you were just asking about, about the sequence of events for infection and vaccination. So I would say it's, it's a trade-off. Maybe the easy way to do it is like build your more complicated model and see, are you getting better fits to data? Are you getting improved predictions? Are you capturing phenomena that you weren't able to capture? But if to first order with a simpler model, you're getting the complexity that you need, maybe that's good enough too but it's, it's probably going to be very sensitive to the specific situation you're dealing with. Okay, thank you. That was an awesome talk. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think everybody did, right? Okay. Um, so when SARS first took hold in Canada, there were mask mandates and capacity mandates, and those still exist in, in restaurants and exercise facilities, graduate student offices. Um, my question is really general about whether a nice model like this was used by Health Canada or could have even been tangible for someone at Health Canada to come up with should be 10 people in Starbucks down on Sherbrooke Street or, or is it just were they just using data that already existed from previous viruses? So there's definitely modelers at PHAC and Health Canada who are like, you know, with very sophisticated models looking at this kind of stuff. But I think one, and I'm not even someone who interfaces super closely, like some people at McGill are literally doing some of these analyses for these public health agencies. Um, I think it's probably a bit of both. It's probably some, you know, basing yourself off of precedent or basing yourself off other guidelines. It's not, I don't think it's all informed by some model because getting a model to the resolution of like, you know, how many people should be in a room where you know the room size varies, the ventilation is going to vary. The you know as soon as you get to a model where as soon as you get to the point where like heterogeneity is becoming very important and like stochastic stuff is becoming very important, these models are not going to be super helpful. So I think um, I think from what I can see, largely they're guiding sort of what our expectation about sort of the future might look like and what the next couple months to s might look like. But in terms of how exactly like even the six foot rule and you know 
for an aerosol pathogen, like it doesn't really matter if I'm standing six feet or not. Like that, you know, that's why I lecture with a mask because the point of an aerosol virus is it gets in the air and it can go, you know, if someone walks in an hour later, they might be able to get it. It becomes aerosolized. So um, I think some, like I'm saying, it's probably a bit of a combination of, you know, do we understand all the biophysics? How precise can the models be? And then just people trying to do their best with hugely changing information all the time. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> not a great answer to your question. More questions? Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I found the part where you were showing uh, the relation between uh, countries that don't have access to vaccines with countries that have access to vaccines. That was a very interesting part of the talk. I was wondering if the results that you have from these studies were shown or if there's, there was any effort to show these results to, uh, to public agencies or if they're interested in such models like this to yeah. for international relations? Yeah, we've, we've presented this to the WHO. We've, uh, I've seen it be translated into some policy tools. Um, but I think it's tough, right? Because there's no central agency that can dictate what every country has to do and at the end of the day if you're making decisions for your country you have a mandate to protect your own population you don't have a mandate to protect the population anywhere else so i think like how you know the who can say something but how that translates into the decisions every country makes is not obvious what i think is important to realize is that it's not uh, everyone's not in a bubble. There, it is an interacting problem, and so just making the calculation based on this decoupled framework is not the right approach, but whether or not that's the calculation people are making is the question, I guess. So, you know, even if, and that's sort of, you know, as boosters are going to be rolled out, it sort of becomes an arms race between boosting and increasing immunity. But if you're competing with variants that are going to keep coming back and become problems and maybe get around that immunity, it sort of says, well, what's the best strategy globally to, to make that better? So the short answer is yes, like, they're ex extremely interested in it, and people are talking about this and thinking about this. There's been a ton of stuff published in this regard, but how that gets translated into the decision every country makes is not obvious. Yeah. Okay. I think you have enough time. Thank you very much. Yay. Okay. Thank our speaker again.